So this lecture is effectively me going to give you a chat of interesting, useful things. Sorry, ladies there? Sorry, ladies? Ladies? Hello? Thank you. Um, this lecture is effectively me giving you a chat about how computers work. Um, now, I had a talk like this. So if you're an electronic engineer, what, what you'd do is you'd get a, given a talk, a lecture like this, about how computers actually work. And then you'd go off for maybe eight weeks, and you'd actually build the computer, solder it together, um, and you get it to work and get it to drive things. Um, <coughs> but what I realized was that this lecture I had was, as an electronic engineer was only um, one hour long, but it was such a useful lecture that I had, um, or got given as an electronic engineering student. Um, it, it, it really sort of helped me throughout my whole, my whole, all my work. So I thought it would be a very good idea to give you some of this content so that you understand how computers work. Now, you won't get, be able to go off and do sort of eight weeks practical, but that doesn't matter. This is sort of a, the key nuggets of information I think you need to know about how, how computers work. So, um, <coughs> no recap of the last lecture. We're going to give a high-level overview of computer architecture, and then we're going to look at a computer called the Sinclair Z80. And we're going to look at programming languages, modern microprocessors, and draw some conclusions. So this is really sort of bits about how I think computers work that I think you must know, like, you know, to function as an engineer, and will be incredibly useful, you know, just in your general understanding of devices. So by the end of this lecture, we're going to understand how this sort of 1982 Sinclair Z80 actually works. Now, um, and, and it, you know, this thing could do amazing graphics like Elite on the side there. That was a fantastic game of the time. Now, you might wonder why I'm going to put so much effort in trying to explain to you how this fantastic computer works, which sort of was, you know, maybe very expensive in 1980. Um, I'm going to do this because these, uh, because this, these computers are basically the same as... I'm wondering if I'm going to go and tell him to, to stop it. If he continues, I'll go and tell him to go and draw somewhere else. Um, the thing about these computers is basically all computers are the same. So whether it's a modern PC with lots of bells and whistles, you know, graphics cards and all that, it's got basically the same architecture as this. So they're all sort of comparable. You know, modern computers are faster and more complicated. But all sort of the basics are in that thing. So if you understand that thing, you'll understand modern computers in general, and you'll be able to sort of extrapolate, and it'll, the whole world of computers will make much more sense to you. So that's what we're going to understand. We're going to try and understand that today. Um, and so before I do that, I thought show you some interesting pictures I took um, whilst I was here. So I went to this uh, museum, it's called the Gerber Museum, and it's in Munich, and it's at the Technological Museum there. And if you ever get a chance to go, it's really, really good. Um, and it's like the, the British um, Science Museum, but it's sort of got a very technical slant. It's very, very different. It's, it's, much, it's very different to um, our Technical Museum. It's well worth a visit. They've got some interesting, lots of interesting exhibits you wouldn't see in the UK. So anyway, whilst I was there, I took some pictures. And they've got a whole exhibition on sort of silicon chips. And this is what I thought, I've taken a few pictures that I thought were interesting. So there's this one. This is a huge sack of transistors. So that it says there's um, 1, uh, 150,000 transistors in there. And they're all, they've all been integrated onto that single chip there. So that, ch that chip there has got the same amount of um, transistors on it. So this sort of is a very nice visual demonstration about sort of how advanced technology is with sort of integration of components on a single chip. So you really are having, you know, modern, modern chips have many more transistors than that on it. So I thought that was quite an interesting picture to show you. The other thing that was quite interesting were these massive ingots. So these ingots there are sort of bigger than me. They're about that big. And it's pure silicon. And it's silicon at sort of 99.9999% purity. So 99's purity, which means they're basically very, very pure. And to make computer chips, what you do is you get one of those ingots and you slice it into a very, very thin sheet, and you get one of these. And it's basically just like a mirror, initially. It's just a very, very polished silicon mirror. And then using sort of optical lithography, so x-rays and stuff like that, sort of shiny x-rays at it and burning holes in it, in effect, you can make computer chips. And each one of those little squares on that silicon wafer is actually a computer chip. And you sort of cut, cut all those chips away from each other, and sort of then you've got your individual chips that are ready to mount in, in packages. And, um, ah, I think this is in a, yeah, so that chip there, you could mount it in a package, and that, this is actually the package when you go and buy it. There's some Siemens um, I.O. chip for communication. 
And uh, when you sort of zoom in on that chip there, you sort of see this huge pattern. You can see all the tra different transistors um, that are there. So sort of you can see banks of memory and processing units and things like that. So that, that in the middle is actually that's, that sort of, uh, uh, sort of bit right in the center there. That's the actual silicon chip. And everything else is just packaging around. And that's some type of CPU or something. So it's quite a nice sort of uh, demonstration of what's in these chips and you know, how they're made at a very high level. And then there's some other things there. Right, so what I thought I'd do now is give you an overview of sort of very high level overview of computer architecture. And you did some of this with me in MATLAB. We sort of very briefly skimmed over the surface of it. We're going to come back to this now. I'm going to do a very little bit refresher, a bit of a refresher. And then we're going to sort of delve into various aspects of the Z80 computer. So let's get going. So I think I showed you this slide when we did MATLAB. And I said, basically, there's lots of different types of computers you're going to use as an engineer. Um, supercomputers down, right down one end, to sort of these embedded computers that are all around us. And then desktop computers are only really one class of computer that's actually quite a small class of computer these days. You know, most computers are not desktop computers running Windows. You know, there's, there's computers everywhere, like in my camera and the projector and the TV. And the, you get computers where you just don't expect to find them. You think, oh, there's a computer running it. And... Uh, you know, these embedded computers are the ones that you guys are going to be able to be using in your careers. You're going to have to program and use and understand. So that's really the focus of this, of this lecture. So here we go, some examples of computers. A computer bolt on the side of the engine there. Com little red board there, that's a little microprocessor driving your maker bot. So anywhere where there's any type of thinking these days, there will be a computer. It will be rigged up to electronics. You're going to have to look at this sort of computers, not just as boxes that run... Windows or whatever. They're sort of elect clever electronic boxes that are connected to all your other electronic components that are driving your device and whatever it is you're making. So here's some examples of, of computers where you may not expect to find them. So voltmeter, it's got a computer in it, okay? Um, MP3 player, computer, phones, massive computers. In fact, some of them these days are supercomputers. Thermometer, it's probably got a computer in it. You know, that thing there, that little robot, two or three computers. Even even your battery to your, to your PC has a computer in it these days. And all it does, its only job is to count charge going into the battery and count charge coming out of the battery and make sure the battery, does, you don't try and overcharge it because it, it will catch on fire. So it's basically this computer, make sure your laptop doesn't ca catch a light when you, um, when, you, uh, when, when you try and charge it. And actually, there's a whole YouTube video there on somebody who's actually tried to hack battery, battery computers and tried to make them blow up. So that's quite fun if you, uh, if you want to watch that. So really, they are everywhere. <clears throat> and very often these days, you know, I've been teaching about, about digital electronics and said, oh, you know, you could use some AND gates or some OR gates to make this circuit. But computers are so cheap these days, you can get them everywhere. Very often, it doesn't make sense to buy discrete logic blocks and sort of plug them into the circuit and make it go. Often it makes much more sense, so instead of doing something like that, just buy a single microprocessor and implement your logical design in computer code and just get the computer to you know, simulate the circuit. And it's sort of overkill using a computer for sort of simple logic, but very often it's, um, it's easier and it's just sort of much more convenient because you just buy that chip. You don't need to buy multiple chips. Um, very often computers are cheaper than buying individual components, so it really is sort of a, almost a crazy use of a computer to um, to simulate glue logic, but people do it because it's cheap, and uh, you know, somebody have done that for this mouse probably. So, <coughs> so there we go. This is how cheap computers are these days. If you put into Google Shopping uh, micro microcontroller, you come up with these these um, these computers as first hit. So you can get a whole whole computer for one pound forty four. So it'll have its memory, it'll have some storage, you know, CPU, everything for one pound forty four you know, one pound something, and, you know, a very, very clever, sophisticated device. It'll probably even have a serial communication port in it. It'll have, you know, very, very sophisticated. Or you can, and these are the type of devices you're probably going to be programming as an engineer because, you know, they're cheap, throw away, pop it in your device, it's suddenly smart. And this Arduino thing, this is based... Who's heard of the Arduino? Yeah, that's just based on a simple microprocessor. So I, I think the Arduino is not actually a name of a chip. I think it's sort of a, 
a platform that's put on a sort of a, a relatively generic microprocessor. So I, I think it's Actel or something like that. Anyway, if you could read the text there, that would tell you what microprocessor it was, and that's an Arduino. So, yeah, computers everywhere these days. That's my point. So when you ever, so if we if we look at this, if we if we look at this um, this this chip, you can see um, there's a number on it, and if you look there there'll be some type of a number. And I've, it's, I've made it a bit small for you to read the number, but always there's a serial number on chips. And these, this serial number will tell you what the chip is and what it, what it is so you can look it up on the internet. And if you Google, so if you, if you looked at the numbers on any of these chips here and stuck it into Google and put the word data sheet, you'll always get the data sheet of the chip. It'll tell you how it'll work and tell you how you can run it. So if you... Google, so I think I, I think I Googled one of these chips here, maybe this one, I can't remember. Um, you get the, the microchip data sheet. So these people make a special type of microprocessor called the PIC, which is a very, very useful type of microprocessor. And if you scroll down this document a bit, you'll find the pinout of the chip. So it's got various, um, various complicated names there. This looks all very, very confusing. But if you scroll down the document, so each pin's got sort of a, you know, a, a, some, some letters against it. And this all looks very confusing. But if you scroll down the, the document a bit more, what you'll see, and notice the pins are labeled from 1 to 9 all the way up to 18. If you scroll down the document a bit more, so if we look at, for example, RA2, what's that? What's that telling me? Don't know. Let's look down the data sheet. We look at RA2 here. We find this table, RA2, bidirectional I.O. port. So that means information. So that means ones and zeros. So out of RA2, we can get the computers to send or receive information. And it's the same with any of these pins. And that, that don't be scared of them ever when you look at data sheets. Just go, oh, this is, you know, this, this thing will tell me how it works. And if you follow this data sheet, it's generally an instruction manual on how to make that chip work for you. Um, <coughs> the other thing is, so this, this chip here comes in a long package, but you can just get them in a different package. So you can get them in a square package if that suits your application better. Um, yeah, so that's basically how you'll find micro, so microcontrollers in the wild, effectively, when you have to go and use them. Um, yeah. So the point of this lecture, really, I guess, is that um, no matter what computer you're looking at, so whether it's one of those little computers, whether it's a big desktop PC, whether it's one your washing machine, or this BBC from 1980, they've all got basically the same architecture. And once you understand one of them, you'll be able to understand all the different architectures, um, or at least you know, have a good idea about what they do and you know, what's special about them. So I'm going to look at some, we're going to kick off by looking at sort of high-level architecture of computers. So I think you've seen this slide before, but I thought it was worth refreshing it. This is, in effect, a computer summed up in a picture. It's got input-output devices, so a keyboard or a screen. It could be you know, any other input-output devices like a thermometer or you know, any type of sensing thing or you know, a posi position sensor on a wheel or a position sensor on a robot arm, input-output devices. Some type of storage to, to hold programs for a long time, some type of memory um, that the computer is going to use to rapidly access programs, and some type of processor that actually does the thinking. And to connect them all together, there's some wires called a bus. I wanted to come to each one of these components and look at it in this Z80 and see um, what it does in more detail. So memory for storing programs. So I'm just going to skip through this. Hard disks for storing permanent memory. Now you might think, well, in these very, very small, small microprocessors, there, there are no, there's no room for hard disks. What do I do? Well, I have a very, very small amount of called flash memory in them. So you can see this is actually a flash chip there. So this is a, a USB stick cracked open. And a t you know, that, that chip there will hold probably a couple of gigabytes of data. So, you know, on those small chips, you might get a meg or a few hundred K just to store your program. So that's called flash. Um, processor, we all know what that is. And then this bus here. This bus is actually quite important, and we'll come to it in a bit more detail later. And this is basically the wires that connect all the components together and let information go between the memory and the processor and the hard disk and the processor. So it's like the big sort of communication transport network for your computer. Okay. So, this is what we're going to look at today. This is the Z80 computer. And you can do amazing graphics with that, and it's actually quite fun if ever you want to program one. 
And incidentally, I think they're still making these chips, and they turn up in things like washing machines and all over. And the reason they still make them is because once a programmer has learned to program one chip, why is he bother wanting to learn to program the next latest chip? He, he can't be bothered. So he just keeps ordering, you know, Z80 chips because he knows how to program them. So, you know, there's millions. Once sort of a, a chip starts getting embedded in industrial applications, you know, they're, they're never stop making them really, even if it's really old. We're not interested in speed. All we're interested in is, you know, does it control the washing machine? Does it make the lights go on and off of the of the gambling machine or, or whatever? So, <coughs> I think we'll skip that. Now, no. this is a Z80 computer. So if you if you cracked that open you would find in it something that looked a bit like this. This isn't actually what's in that box, because somebody's made this, and it's just um, what's in that box would probably look a bit more professional. But in principle, it's exactly the same device with not more chips in it. So, and even, if we, if we look, this is the processor chip, and if we look here, you can see it's got some numbers on it that this time you can see. Here, you can see it says Z80. That's just the name of the chip. So if you put Z80 into Google, you'd find the data sheet for that chip. So, a computer is basically just a collection of seven chips. I'm going to tell you about these chips now and just sort of give you some background into them. So, this is a circuit diagram of that computer. Now, it looks horrendously scary, and you might think, now, I'm never going to understand that. That's far too complicated. Why are you scaring me? It's not that difficult. And actually, you understand most of this already. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this diagram in the next few slides. I'm going to pick out various aspects of this, and I'm going to show you you already understand it, or if you don't understand it, I'm going to explain it to you. And once you've got this, you've got the inner workings of all computers. Okay? So then, let's pick something easy to start with. So, let's look at this. This, then we want to guess what that is. We want to be smart and try and guess what that is. Go on, go on. You've got something on your lips, was it, no? Oh, does it? Where does it say on the top? Where does it say that? I can't see that. Ah! Oh. <laughs> that spoiled my game. Okay. Well, I won't ask you any more questions. Good answer, though. Good answer. <laughs> okay, so this is the power supply. So I've sort of cut that power supply at the diagram. And you've actually studied this before. So on power supplies I've taught you about before, you've had a bridge rectifier and a transformer. So here's a transformer on the right. It feeds into a bridge rectifier, and it'll give you some type of lumpy, lumpy AC, if, if, if you remember. And then you feed this into a capacitor, and then there's this voltage regulator here that sort of smooths out that lumpy AC. And then the load here is basically the, um, the computer. So this is effectively a power supply circuit that you've done already. So here's, here's the bridge rectifier. It's not in that picture. The bridge rectifier is probably over there. Voltage regulator... That's what the voltage regulator looks like. So when you buy one, it just looks like a little thing with three legs. So what will come out of here is some type of lumpy, um, sort of lumpy AC-DC signal. So this, basically. So out of, so our bridge rectifier would sit in there. So here. A bit of a capacitor here. So this is, this is what's coming out of the circuit about here. And you put it through your, through your, um, through your, um, uh, basically, uh, through your uh, voltage regulator, and it will smooth out this sort of this lumpy DC AC into a nice plus five volts that's ready for your computation. So you already really understand the power supply of this little computer. Okay. So if we look on this board, we can see where the uh, where the where the um, voltage regulator is. So this is the voltage regulator. Here's our capacitor. Um, and notice this voltage regulator is mounted on a massive heat sink because, all, all the, because it's got to chop off effectively, like we went through in the other lecture. It's basically got to chop off this sort of this lumpy voltage here, and it just gets to make it nice, smooth DC, and it basically just gets dissipated as heat. So that's why it's got a nice big heat sink on it. Okay? So I'm trying, so tick, we've done that one. So I'm trying to sort of effectively teach you the, the practical aspects of a bit of electronics here. So now we're going to look at the CPU. Now, this is not as difficult as you may think. So if you Google Z80 CPU, you'll get a picture like this up. And you've got these various pins on the outside that you could look up on your data sheet and figure out, um, you know, 
Oh, I'm not expecting you to remember all these pinouts and everything, obviously. I'm just after basic broad, broad principles. So the pins that look really obvious to understand might be the plus 5 volts and the ground. That's just how we get power into it. So if we want this computer to start up, we just apply plus 5 volts and ground to the chip. The other pin that's really easy to understand is the reset pin. So all computers have got this reset button. So if we just put in a, a positive voltage to the reset pin, the computer reset, resets. So you see, all these functions aren't complicated. They're just pins on a chip. And uh, you know, once you can read data sheets, then you're sorted, basically. So the other pin we can look at is a clock. Now, we've done clocks before. Um, we, had, we had various types of circuit where we applied a clock, and things happened on clock pulses. Well, this whole CPU is basically a load of logic, and it needs a clock to synchronize its operations. And the clock is literally a series of 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. They just synchronize everything and make sure everything happens in a nice, staggered, staged way. And we looked at these in JK flip-flops. So that's another pin we understand. All pretty simple so far. So we've sort of done the CPU. I've not put a tick by it because we're going to come back to it. We've done the uh, power supply. The next thing is this box down at the bottom in the red. And this is the clock circuit. So this is the circuit that generates the clock. So this is the circuit that generates this 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 signal. Excuse me. I'm still recovering from a cold. So what we've got here, um, does anybody recognize those, those, um, those triangles with a, little, with a little ball on the front? What are they? Anybody want to shout out? Not gate, right? So we've got some not gates. You understand the not gates. And what, what this basically is, is this is a couple of not gates connected back to back. And it's sort of, um, in effect, when you put a, when you put a, when one not gate outputs a one, the other not gate sees a one and then outputs a zero. And then you see we've connected the output back into the other, to the back end of it. So you've sort of got this train of, sort of um, one zero one zero one zero. So sort of each knot gate is triggering, triggering the other knot gate, and effectively they're, they're turning on and off, on and off, on and off as quickly as possible. And this will produce a a one and a zero, one and a zero pulse. I don't expect to explain this circuit. I just want you to be aware that it exists, and to sort of regulate these knot gates triggering each other and turn each other on and off really quickly. What you do is you shove a piezoelectric crystal, and this crystal will force this circuit. Um, basically to resonate at a particular frequency. And you can buy these, these resonators. And we looked at piezoelectric crystals as sort of strain, stress or strain sensors. But you can, there, are also, there are other uses as resonators. And you can buy these things, and they look like that. So they look like basically a can. And on the top of them, um, it'll have a number. So this one's got 18.083 megahertz, you can see. That's the frequency at which it resonates. So if you plot one of those into there, this circuit will resonate at that frequency. Okay? Um, and we can just see here the can of the, of the crystal popping out of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the circuit. And this is probably, this, this here is probably that not gate chip. So we've, we're understanding more of the circuit now. Okay? So we've done that, we've done that. Um, we've almost done the CPU, so let's continue. So, I taught you this principle when we did MATLAB the, the, other, the other year. And I said, basically, the general principle is, the further away you get from your CPU, so here's our CPU, the slower it is to get data. So if we try and get data out of our memory, it's pretty quick. If we try and get data out of our hard disk, it's a bit slower. If we try and get data out of Dropbox or some cloud account, it's much, much slower. So in general, the further you get from your CPU, the slower, um, the slower it is to access data. Now, what this means is, if we can have a little bit of memory on our CPU, access, actually on the CPU, memory to that, access to that is going to be very, very fast indeed. And on each CPU, it's got a very, very small amount of memory, very small, to store like numbers that it's working on right now. And we're talking like this thing has got, and each, each one of these pieces of memory is called a register, okay? And it can literally, each one of these pieces of memory can literally store one number, no more, okay? So we've got registers A, B, C, D, and E. That means that this chip can store five numbers at a time. That's it. We're not talking kilobytes. 
nothing like that, not talking megabytes. Five numbers, okay? So it could store 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, nothing more. Okay, and it uses these registers to work on the data that it's got from the memory. So these are sort of the, the thing it's working on immediately, okay? And modern computers will have more, but not, not a huge amount more. So, if um, in MATLAB last year we looked at this, so we said basically, we wrote little programs like A equals 0, A equals A plus 1, A equals A plus 2. And this is sort of, this language, MATLAB, is made for humans basically. This is made for humans to understand computers, interact with computers. But what actually is going on the chip when you say A equals 0, A equals A plus 1, A equals A plus 2 is a little bit different to this, so there's a sort of high level abstraction. It's much more sort of machine orientated. So we're going to look at that now. So, <coughs> on a, on a, your, your MATLAB program might go A equals 0, A equals A plus 1, A equals A plus 2. Now the instruction, your chip, so your Z80 chip or whatever it is, will actually execute looks like this. So you have a command, then you'll have a variable, then you'll have a number. So the command mov means move, okay? So we're moving 0 into, so here's my mouse, we're moving 0 into the local variable A, okay? So th this is all this command does. It moves 0 into A. Then the next command, you can probably guess what this does, add A, comma 1, adds A, adds 1 to A. Next command, you can almost certainly guess by now if you're paying attention, adds 2 to A. So this is called sort of assembly language or machine code. And this is much, much closer to actually what the computer is doing. And this A is actually in that CPU. It's not, you know, it's not in memory. It's actually in that chip. So it's very important to notice that each of these commands has three parts. It's got the instruction, the sort of the memory on which it's operating, and the number which it's, which it's doing. So it's got three very, very well-defined parts to instruction. So operation, variable, number. Okay? Now, there's sort of a bit of an oversimplification, but it'll get the it gets the message across. So here we go. Instruction is add, variable one is A, information is one. So this is a very well-defined instruction that that chip is going to understand. Okay? Oh, if anybody's stuck, if anybody's lost or wants me to repeat something, just shout. I'm very happily run over things again. So, here's... A, now, as we learn, computers work on binary, okay? So we've been doing lots of work on binary numbers and counting in binary. Now, each one of these... Um, instructions has a binary representation, so actually a representation in ones and zeros. So the chip, if we look at the move command, the chip will recognize the move command as 1101. So when you give that chip a series of 1101, it will move some information. Each variable has got a number. So in this case, A has got the number of 0000. And obviously, binary 0 is 0000. Okay? Then if we look at the add instruction, so we said add 1 to A. So the add instruction will also have its own individual code, okay? So add might be 0, 1, 0, 0. And then register A, again, has a number 0, 0, 0. And this time we're adding 1 to it, so it's got the number 0, 0, 0, 1. And then we've got another add instruction, 0, 1, 0, 0. Um, and we want to add a 2 to register A. So you can see all these instructions we've broken down our program into basically have a binary representation, okay? So this is what the computer actually works on. So, <coughs> here's another picture to, to sort of simplify it. So whatever language you program in, whether it's MATLAB, C, Python, whatever, any language you program in, it's broken down into basically machine code, so basically sort of, or assembly, sort of a instruction. So move 0 to A, add 1 to A, add 2 to A. And then the computer actually interprets that as some type of binary number. So in this case, if we wanted to um, move 0 into A, we'd send the computer this. Any questions so far? This is about as hard as it gets. Any questions so far? Anybody confused? Happy to run over stuff again? Nope? OK. Right. So why is he telling me all this? So then we've sort of now done the CPU. So now let's look at the memory. Okay. So this is a zoomed in picture of the memory. Now on this computer there's two types of memory chip. There's RAM and there's ROM. 
So let's look at these in detail. So this chip here, can you see that one there with the window? That is a ROM. ROM stands for write or read-only memory. It's like memory that's embedded in the computer and uh, it never gets deleted, never gets changed. This is like, the, like your BIOS on your computer. It's like the code that will never change. Um, in fact, normally you have something called um, WORM, which is write once, read many. So when you make the device, you, you make the chip, you sort of write your program for this chip once and then you, you don't ever touch it. This chip's quite interesting. And can you see it's got a little window, and you can actually see the silicon through the window on the top of the chip. This is actually to erase the chip if you really want to erase a chip. So you can actually get UV light, shine it in on that chip, and you'll erase the program literally with photons um, from the top of that chip. And then you can, you can program it again, but it takes quite a while, and it's quite slow. And you have to apply very big voltages to it to program it. So that's our ROM. That's our read-only memory. So you might store, I don't know, a small bit of the operating system in there, or your BIOS code, or something like that. <coughs> this is a RAM chip. So we're going to look at the RAM chip in a little bit of detail. So here it is. And again, if you just Google the number that's on top of that chip, you get the data sheet for it, and it tells you how to use it. It's like an instruction manual for that chip. Now, here is a picture of our memory chip. So, and here on the left-hand side is a diagram of computer memory. Now, every address in computer memory is given a number, okay? So at location, and you can store a number in any of these locations or any information in any of these locations. So we've got location zero right at the bottom, two, three, four, five, I missed one, five, six, all the way up to some big, big m number. So every sort of place in this, it's like a bookshelf. You think of a bookshelf, you can store a piece of information. Now then. Here we go, we've stored some binary numbers in our memory. Now this is where it gets good, because I'm going to show you how computer programs execute. So do you remember our program we made just now that added, basically, that moved a, 0 to A, 1 to A, 2 to A, and we generated this series of binary numbers, yeah? Remember that? Well, if we want the computer to run this, all we do, this is all we need to do to get the computer to run our program, is stick it in memory, literally just stick it in memory like this, boom in memory, and then you turn the computer on. And what will happen when you turn the computer on is it just starts executing code at the sort of the zeroth memory location. So that's all it does. So let's, let's, let's execute this code. So we turn it on. We apply these series of clock pulses to our CPU. Okay. And what the computer does is it reads this first instruction, and it goes, oh, that means move zero to A. And it does it. Okay. Just after that clock pulse. So we've now got zero equals A. Then what we do, so watch these clock pulses here, we apply another clock pulse, and the computer moves to the next location in memory, and goes, oh, that big number there means add 1 to A. Then A equals 1. So this is all a computer does. It's just ex executing binary numbers one after another, which happen to be instructions. Then we apply another clock pulse, boom. Moves to the next location, and it goes, oh, this big binary number must mean move 2 to A. Now, or add 2 to A, and now A equals 3. This is all the computer does. They, they give the illusion of being clever, but this is all they do. They just start at memory location zero and start executing the code. And <coughs> there's other instructions called loop instructions. So you might have an instruction here that says, oh, go back to the beginning. <coughs> That's all a loop is. Okay, this, is. this is all they do, all day long. Not clever. Yep. Any questions on that? Nope. Okay. So we've done the CPU, done the clock, done the power supply, sort of done the ROM and the RAM. I think what's coming next is input and output, but we'll see. What's this? Ah, right, okay. Now, I just want to go over, basically, how the CPU, how the, how the processor connects to the memory. And it really is incredibly simple and incredibly well worth learning. So, do you notice that between the CPU and the ROM and the RAM, there's like these thick black wires. Can you see connecting the CPU to the memory, these thick black wires. They are basic, and when they come next to the CPU, they sort of fan out into multiple, multiple wires. These are, um, these are, in effect, sort of, they're called bus wires, and these are the wires that transmit information between, in this case, the processor and the ROM and the RAM. So, if you, so this is some, I think this was the, the, the chip that, I, that was in that picture previously. If you go and Google that memory chip, it will give you this pinout. 
So it's got VCC as always power, uh, we've got a ground, that's always zero, and we've got some various pins. Now again, this looks horrifically complicated, but it's not. We're just going to go through it now, and we'll explain how the processor and the memory talk to each other using the bus. So here we've got a memory chip. Give it a bit of power. You can't go wrong with giving chips power. They like that. OK. Now then, these pins, you see it's got A0, A1, A2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to uh, 14. These are called the address pins. OK. So these are called the address pins. That's why they've got an A in front of them. These pins here, can you see it's got IO0, IO1, IO2, all the way up to IO7. These pins are called the data pins. Okay? That's how you get data in and out of your chip. Now, this is how you store memory, store information in a computer chip. This is all there is to it, and it's literally three slides. So if I wanted to store uh, some data in location 0000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 of this chip, all I'd do is put 0000000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, so zero volts, on all the address pins, so that's a big bi long binary number of zero, then all I do is I put the data I want to store on the data pins, so in this case I want to store 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 in the data pins. Now can anybody guess what we do next to make this information get stored in the chip? What's the next obvious thing we need to do to make anything happen in digital electronics? Clock. Did I hear a clock? Yeah, exactly. So we clock the chip. So all we do is apply a clock pulse here, and then this chip has stored this number at that location in the chip. That's all there is to computer memory. Okay. And then, again, if we want to store a different number in a different address, so in this, this time I've changed the address to 0000001, 000 000 000 000 so at location 1, and we just apply the data we want to uh, save in the chip, clock it, and it'll store that data. So there we go. We've got CPU, ROM, RAM, power supply, clock. Final thing is input and output. Now, this is potentially the most useful aspect to you guys because so often you'll be able to buy a computer just on a board already made for you, but you'll need to interface the real world through hardware. So this is how you interface the real world uh, with hardware. So... Ah, yeah, the final thing I want to mention is that basically um, I told you how chips store memory, how, how chips store, how, how memory chips store data. So all you need to do is basically connect those address and data wires up to your CPU, and it will be able to funnel data between the chip and the CPU without any problem at all. So that's all that's explained. Uh, now. now, I want to focus now on this input and output of data. So this is getting your, getting your chip to talk to the real world. And this is actually incredibly easy. So imagine we want our super complica complicated computer to just flash an LED to make the LED go on, off, on, off, on, off. This is how we do it. And it's much simpler than you might think. So here's some LEDs. <coughs> so what we do is we find an unused address in memory. Okay? So here's our memory. And so right high up in the memory, we say this location, 1111111101, we say this is the address we're going to use to talk to our, to our LED. And then what we do is, so this is the chip on the left-hand side, and it can basically spit out um, what address it wants to talk to, to the memory. But instead of connecting memory at this particular location, whoops, instead of connecting... Uh, instead of having this, this location wired to a memory chip, what you can do is you can make a big AND gate on the, on the output of your, of your address bus to your, to, your, to your chip. And you basically make this AND gate go on whenever the computer tries to, tries to read from the memory on this address. So whenever it tries to access this address, it's going to stick this number here on its address pins. And rather than having these connected to a memory chip, you just connect this to your big AND gate that sort of specifies that address. And then what happens? So this is then on whenever you put the correct address here. And then you connect a data pin from the CPU out to another AND gate. And what happens is whenever you try and write 
date, whenever you set the address output of the chip to that number, this gate goes on, and then whatever data you put on your data bus will basically be fed into your AND gate there. And by setting the, the, the value of that D1 pin to basically 1 or 0, you can turn on or off this light bulb. So basically, uh, what you can do is basically by moving a 1 or a 0 into this address here, you can basically make this pin go high or low, which would turn on or off your light bulb. So basically, if you, if you sort of use this sort of glue logic to glue together your address and your data bus, you can actually just output whatever you want like that. So there we go, all sorted. Um, <coughs> oh, no. I saw another one. Hang on, where's it gone? Right. So the other obvious question is reading. How do we, how do we read data in from hardware? Well, it's exactly the same. We sort of make this, this uh, gate basically trigger again whenever we put this number on our address bus. So that's when we're ever trying to read uh, from this location here. Oh, I keep losing my slide. I'm very sorry. Yeah. And then rather than sort of... Um, and what we can then do is put an input into the, an, a secondary AND gate here and feed that wire back around to the data pin, to the data pin of our CPU. And then what happens is whenever we, want, whenever we try and read from this location in memory, whoops, what happens? We're basically reading directly this wire um, from the AND gate. So that's effectively reading and writing to hardware um, yeah, from, uh, from the outside world. So I think... Yeah, so what else do I have? Yeah, so that, that's basically it. So m today, what you do is you go and buy most of these components on a single, single chip there. So um, I prob what would I examine you on this? Uh, what, would be, what would be fair? I probably just want you a general appreciation of what's going on. So, you know, like there's memory, there's processor. Um, processor's not got much memory in it. Um, bus, what's the bus, bus for? Um, you know, um, it'd be nice if you could know maybe, you know, um, how a chip store, stores data. So, you, you know, you've got the address, you've got the data, and then when you clock it, it stores the memory. That'd be quite nice to know. What other stuff? Yeah, so I wouldn't really expect detailed explanations. But this is sort of a, a background that um, I hope you'll find useful um, when you come up against computers. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it, really. So um, if you've got questions, I'm very happy to field them now. Uh, about this or anything. I think we've got a few, couple of minutes. Um, yeah, so anybody got any questions they want to shout out? Nope. Okay, so um, you're free to go. Right.